Good day, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Landfreaker Talks. I'm your host, Chris, and for those who are new to our show, the Landfreaker Talks is focused on amplifying diverse voices on AI, technology, and data. We strive to cultivate an inclusive platform where diverse perspectives thrive, and in so doing, we aim to reshape the conversation to reflect a more equitable understanding of AI's impact on our world. Welcome, Samuel Rotunda. It's a real honor to have you, as always. Um, I knew, I don't really know when we met. It feels like it was years ago, but I met you physically last year, May, in Kigali, Rwanda. Yeah, that's correct. I think we've been talking um, ever since 2022. Mm. Um, yeah, how through did, the how did we meet? Isaac and Dania. Ah. And then, yeah, you were actually one of our keynote speakers when we started Buzz NLP. I remember that. And was an, okay, the Ambassador NLP kickoff. That's where we met. That's how we met. Yes. Oh, I see. It's lovely. Yeah. Then we met physically in um in May 2023. Yes. Yes. And we talked for I think six hours. That was one of my best moments in Kigali. The high rides building overlooking the beautiful Kigali city. And talking just about stuff, about yeah, NLP yeah. and different things and plans for Africa, language <laughs> technology. Yeah, yeah, That's... definitely. I've been, I've been looking to, to, to meet again and it's quite a pleasure because, yeah, that night was really good. Uh, yes, yes. Stuff. Yeah, yeah the, I, those are one of the moments I was like, I wish this could last forever, you know, at least for longer. Yeah, because yeah. we talked way into midnight and we had more things to say. It was it was a very insightful discussion. Okay, let's let's introduce, um, let other people know more about you. So let's enter more into an introduction. I always start by asking this question. If if you could describe yourself in one phrase, like who is Samura Rotunda? Yeah. So who is Samuel Rutunda? Um, I would say Samuel Rutunda is a passionate man who, who looks out to use technology um, to improve um, and uh, contribute to the development of Africa. I see. That's wonderful. So you're passionate about using technology to contribute to the development of Africa. Correct. I see. That's wonderful. And how sort of, I want to understand your journey. So how did you start, how did you get to start working with technology? You know, why technology? How did you like fall in love with technology? Hmm. Yeah, I guess it started back in high school. Um, yeah, I I got to play around with the computer a bit late. Uh, so it started with high school. Um, I had friends who were interested in technology. And I think uh, one cool things we started with was I used to get good grades in school. So we, we discovered Excel and we found out that our... Uh, um, school reports were done in Excel. So we made a prank to our parents where they changed my grades. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, they wrote a, 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 a letter saying, oh, this this kid is uh, uh, indisciplined. He fights with his teachers. <laughs> <laughs> I could remember the, the, I can still remember the image uh with the face of my father, he was shocked. He was like, is this you? <laughs> um, yeah, and then um, at some point, I, uh, through a friend, we discovered programming. I think back, in, back then, you know, you had a computer and I always wanted to know what's inside, how does it work? 
um, how can I get access to it? Like internet was really a big thing. You can use as much as internet as you want. So, and the hardware was, was magic. Um, well, it's magic to me. But the software side was, um, was more of um, something accessible. And through the friend, we discovered programming C. And I remember back then, we created like a, a club. Um, it was like people were interested with programming and we could print down um, some tutorials and then uh, we could print them down because you don't know where you get the internet and not everybody has a computer. So by printing them down, we could share them and try to read and try to to work around with it. And um, yeah, so from there, I think when I finished, I went to do my um, bachelor in China and I did telecommunication engineering. Um, and from there, I was part of a research team. Um, the research team was, um, we're doing uh, Wi-Fi uh, emerging technologies. And uh, when I went for my uh, graduate studies, my master's, uh, I had a professor who was, he was really encouraging us to look into emerging technologies. And at that time, I think it was 2016, AI was, was trending, um, yeah, with the reinforcement learning and uh, the, the game of Go. So we're looking, can we use it for networking? I was, I was doing my research on networking and wireless. Uh, by that time, I, I did not use it. So uh, back in 2018, 2019, when I came back to, to Rwanda, um, I got, there was an opportunity to, to start AI Saturday. So there was like AI Saturday in Kigali. And I was like, oh, wow, this is the opportunity for me to join uh, AI. And from there we joined. And uh, after we joined, we learned, we understood, oh, this is how deep learning works. Uh, but I, 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 at, at that point I understood like, oh, we, I need more practical problems. Mm -hmm. And then through mm -hmm. a friend, I, I found out that they are working on Kinyarwanda. Um, I think Kinyarwanda is, and even Bantu languages in general, uh, they, they are very morphologically rich, uh, which means uh, they, you combine a lot of morphemes to create a word. And he was looking of a way to, to code it. And I think he was still thinking of uh, uh, coding using normal programming. Uh, but I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, I've, I just studied AI and I know there's some way we can use AI for, for it. Uh, and uh, the thing is, he told me that many people are working on it. And indeed, based on my experience in Rwanda, I know so many people are passionate about it. Uh, and uh, but the thing is, they start working on it. You know, it's a passion project, but you don't know where to start. And then you get overwhelmed and then you quit. So I, I was like, oh, you know what? Uh, if many people are working on it, let me bring them together and uh, see what we, we can do. I'll just see around. Probably they are way better than me and I'll learn from them. And uh, when we called out to invite people, uh, my friend came that time, and then I found out we were the only ones who who knew about it, about some some form of AI and some form of uh, NLP. Uh, and I was, I was just a beginner. Just I think <laughs> I'd read an article of Kathleen Siminu where she 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 did some work on Kinyarwanda. And that's that's it. So I was forced to to learn because I had to teach the students. <laughs> Uh, I had to teach them um, how it works. So every we could meet every every day, and I had to teach them. And even my friend, he got busy, so I remained the, the only one. And that's through that meeting. That's how I met with Digital Muganda. At that time, they were just focusing on uh, data collection. They were working on the Common Voice project, and uh, at some point, we realized, oh, we say, okay, 
you have the data. Uh, they've been they, at, at that time they were going around collecting text data, and we needed to analyze text data. We're looking: can we build a spell, spell checker, and can we analyze the text? And then they were like, okay, you can help us analyze the data, and you can bring up uh, the technical expertise. And that's how I joined. And at some point, they needed me to work full full time so that I help them. And I think that was back in 2020. And that's when I fully joined Digital Mutant. Wow. Yeah. That is very interesting. Wait, hold up. You, you did your bachelor's in China? Yes, yes. In Wuhan. Wow, in Wuhan, China. <laughs> That's interesting. Uh, was I your bachelor's know, right? in the English language or in the Chinese language? Don't say Chinese, please. It was in English. It was an oh. international program. Uh, okay. Yes. Wow. Wow. All the mm. way to China. That's that's interesting. Yeah. That's Small that's very. In I bet you how you know some. You can speak Chinese a bit. Yes. Yes, I do speak a bit. Wow. That's that's wonderful. Your story is interesting. It's an interesting story of someone on a journey and learning of being forced to learn to to teach others and work with others and, and other people. That's a very interesting journey. It's interesting for me because a lot of the time I get uh, people telling me, hey, I'm really interested in AI. How can I learn I want to learn, I want to do something. And your story is a kind of an advice, you know, you learn by getting involved and even pushing yourself when you, you know, it's the moment where you don't know something, you know, you and you you have to teach or you have to do something with it, it. You know, putting yourself in such kind of situations that actually push you to learn and, and learn in a very useful way because you're learning and your knowledge is directly being applied or immediately being applied somewhere that's that's very interesting it's also so when your 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 friend told you that there are many people working on it did he mean that there are many people working on on the language aspect of it or on the ai aspect and i'm asking because it's interesting that when you went there it was just the two of you who had the expertise in ai yeah, so they were working on the language aspects. Um, yeah, I they see. were working on the language aspects. Later, I got to make, meet people who, who were working on it. Um, like, for, for example, someone wanted to build a text-to-speech. And basically what they did, they recorded all the syllabs in Kinyarwanda. And you could, like, when you write, it just captures the syllabs and uh, it, it it reproduced the sound. So uh, mm -hmm. with time, I, I meet many people, and I, I yeah, I guess the more I spend time with within the field and the community, I get I got to meet those people. But given the the challenge and given um, our background, it, it mm. wasn't an easy task. You you, you really have had to start from scratch. I, I think. Um, when it comes to voice technology, for example, I have the the record to say, oh, I'm the first person to have ever tested speech to text. I'm the first person to have ever tried mm. text to speech because those things did not exist for Kinyarwanda. So, um, and back then, uh, uh, the technology was not as available, and the information was not as available as, uh, at least not in Rwanda, as as um, it were mm -hmm. for other languages, yeah. I see. That's that's quite. That's really really interesting. Okay, so you 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 talked about joining Digital Omoganda full time, sometime in twenty twenty, and meeting them before when they were doing data collection for Common Voice. Tell us more about Digital Omoganda. What is Digital Omoganda? What is what was Digital Moganda doing before and where is Digital Moganda now? Yeah, so Digital Moganda um, 
started actually, we'll, we'll be celebrating um, five years uh, at the end of uh, this month, on the 28th. Wow, that's great. Happy anniversary. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Um, and um, uh, officially, it started uh, as a hackathon. Uh, I think um, Mozilla, uh, Mozilla Common Voice, uh, uh, they were looking to expand to African languages. And they had a partnership with uh, um, GIZ. Uh, the Digital Transformation Center. Uh, and they organized the hackathon uh, whereby uh, people had to present the best ways to collect the data. And uh, the founders, they they got inspired with uh, the idea of Umuganda. And I think that it exists within many cultures, especially in Africa, uh, whereby Every uh, it, within a specified amount of time in Rwanda, it's every end of every last Saturday of uh, the month. The month, uh, people come together to do communal work. So it can be fixing a road, removing bushes within uh, the communal grounds, or building um, uh, a house of uh, someone destitute within the community. So it's like community work. Um, that's been done for, 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 for some time in Rwanda. Uh, and um, basically because this work of collecting voice data involved a lot of people to contribute and you need to incentivize them, you need to bring them together and say, okay, you need to contribute. So uh, are the founders part of an idea of... Um, can we use the concept of Muganda? Is something the Rwandans know already. And we say, okay, this time we are using it for digital and it will help you to create the infrastructure that can at some point uh, be useful. So like Siri or Alexa or Google Voice. And uh, yeah, when they presented the idea, they got, they, they won, they, they, they had the first place. Uh, but then I guess from, um, from an entrepreneurship uh, perspective, they've been doing business for quite some time. They noticed that uh, the task they were given was just one to two hours, uh, which was not enough. So it's it's a good pro proof of concept, but you can't do much with one to two hours of data collection. And um, they pitched it to uh, GIZ, uh, DTC, and uh, they got the funding to do 1,200 hours. And uh, that's when, when they were pitching it, they had to formally register as a company and that was done back in uh, the end, uh, 28th of February. And that was five years ago and that's, that's how it all started. Wow, a a hackathon idea turned into a startup. That's that's very inspiring. Digital Muganda for me personally was a huge inspiration around I can't remember the year exactly, but it was around this time in of my life where I was saying what I was really passionate about speech processing for African languages and I had this idea that yo if you really want to open up the world of of um of language and digital language transformation in Africa you really need to look at speech all this text we're doing can only take us so far because I mean as a young Nigerian I know that a lot of the the values and the the deep rooted conversations are through the acoustic medium and I was really in that space where, well, I was. We need to work on speech technologies. We need to figure out data sets, and then Digital Muganda made made headlines because of the one thousand two hundred hour data set, the largest after English on Common Voice, the only largest for. It's made so many headlines. I was, I was very impressed. And when I read the article explaining the Digital Muganda concept, I was also very 
happy to find that such a concept like Omoganda, where the community is coming together to work on something, it still exists somewhere on the African continent. That was, yeah, that was very, very touching. That was so touching. So, okay, so Digital Omoganda, okay, you registered to get the the 1200 hours data set and get the funding for it. What was the experience like on this journey to get 1200 hours data set? You guys had never done it before. Yeah, just what was the experience like? Oh yeah, <laughs> it was uh, quite an adventure. And you know, most people, um, yeah, they're, they're, we, we learned a lot, I would say that. Uh, we learned a lot. You know, first is, where do you get the data? Uh, in Africa, um, we don't have much online presence. I think things are changing, but uh, back then there were limited online presence. Um, so you will go, for example, to a reputable news organization and you say, oh, can I get some text? Um, we want to use it for this concept. And they'll be like, yeah, this is a good idea, but unfortunately we delete um, the text. So you'd be like, wow, okay. Um, so we found that some organizations, news organizations in Rwanda, they, they were gentle enough to provide us with the text, um, but also the quality wise uh, of the text. I think when you check currently, you find we have, 2,300 hours, uh, but the 300 hours uh, is a bit messy because of the quality of the text that we got at that time. Uh, we use some scraping, we use, uh, and you, you find that <laughs> it was quite a lot of things to learn. Um, and one thing, and I think because we helped, we, we, we talked um, and we helped those who did Luganda and Swahili, and you'll find that one of the things, especially within the common voice format when you are reading an existing text, one of the hardest parts was to get the text. Um, so getting the written text was not easy. Um, so at some point we went to the news and they gave us, but it finished. And then at some point now you start, you need to start creating the text. Uh, I think today it will be easier because there is like ChatGPT. You can probably use machine translation. Um, but back then, yeah, we had to create manually. You give people topics, so you have to be very creative on how you give people topics so that they create a uh, heterogeneous uh, text. Uh, and then um, now to incentivize people to to collect, uh, we went through universities. I, I think. They understood uh, the concept. You organize events, um, and uh, uh, but but how do you ensure the quality? I think that was also another challenge. So uh, you needed people, at least regular people, who can work on it to make sure that the quality is respected. Uh, and then I'll say also one thing that was a blessing in disguise was COVID. Um, because during COVID, many people were stranded at home. Um, there were some lockdowns and people didn't have much to do. So that really helped us uh, to collect and increase uh, the data up to now where we have 2,000 hours. 2,300 were recorded, but 2,000 hours were validated. I see. And And what was the format of this? Um, data collection. So w w walk me through a typical day. So let's say it's uh, you're in the you're in the midst of this collecting this twelve hundred hours, and there's a particular on a particular day you you know let's say it's Monday and it's time to collect the data. W what was a day to day activity like? What was happening in the morning? What was happening in the afternoon? I remember there was a picture and I saw some people in like a in an office, a large office with computers in front of them. So what was the data collection day-to-day -day activity like? 
Yeah, so I, I guess the the hardest part is especially at the start because you need people to trust you, you need people to know what you're doing, you need people to understand. And what we were doing was to go through universities. Um, the universities were gracious enough to offer their place so we can organize like a meetup event. And we will teach people how to do it. Uh, how do you record? How do you create an account? Uh, what you should do, what you shouldn't do. And um, yeah, basically we, we teach people. Um, and once they are taught, we kind of bring incentives. We say, okay, whoever is the best to record, he's going to get a special prize. Um, so that's that's how they, they did. And we could offer some small incentives. Uh, so if you achieve this amount, you, you get uh, this this price. Um, and um, uh, from there, uh, from there, people knew it and uh, people could record uh, uh, in, um, in their spare time, especially during COVID. So from there and then, now once we have those community, we, we also had um, people we call co commoners. Um, we call them commoners. Uh, and their job was to bring more people. So they were like our interface between us and those people who record. Uh, and so you, you for example, we could pick uh, like um, influential, um, like student leaders, uh, student leaders uh, within the university. So they know people around campus and they could go around and they would say, okay, come and contribute. And, and then I think another group that we found very helpful were the Jehovah's Witness. Um, you know, they, they already know how to read. They, they, they have a lot of materials and uh, we explained to them what we were doing and they, they got on board. And so through the communities, we were able to, to bring more, to bring in people. And um, those people, once they, they get a hang and they understood the concept, they could also bring, bring in people. Uh, however, to ensure the, um, the consistency, at some point we realized that uh, um, the, the quality was not good. So even though, you know, it's volunteer work, so it's not like you can, you can say you should, should, should do very well or what. So we found out that it's important that we have a dedicated team uh, who does the validation. And those who, da, who, di, who did the validation, they could help us. Uh, it's a small community in Rwanda, it's a small country, so uh, we know each other. So um, if they found out some errors, we'll try to figure out, oh, here there's an error. And then we'll try to see if we can reach the person and say, okay, can you correct this and can you not this? Um, but at some point it became um, self-driven where we were not doing many events as we used to. Uh, and people were already working and, and offering their voices. And, and people were already working and offering their voices remotely. So in their homes, they were no longer coming to a place. Yeah, they were working uh, remotely. Um, one thing I think Common Voice did well, and I think we can all learn from it, is mobile smartphones are a very useful tool in Africa and many people use it. So they made the, the, the platform to be mo mobile friendly. Uh, thus, it will allow people to to work remotely. So what we will do, we will help them uh, with getting internet. Uh, internet was was not easy, so we could provide uh, internet with them for them, and then they could they could do the work remotely. When you say provide internet for them, you mean sort of like um, recharge, data. Their, give them data, so they do the work. And is this for yeah. every? every volunteer or is it was it just for selected volunteers uh so I, I think we had set up a quota um we had set up a quota that 
because you know if you give once and then we we pay for the internet we we, we buy in bulk so uh it couldn't have worked so we say okay show us that you are serious and if you are serious we will i see i see that's that's a very interesting story what i find most fascinating about the whole thing you and Digital Morganda did is how you were able to get many people to believe in your vision and in what you were doing. Believe it so much that they would offer up their time and volunteer for this project. It's It's very inspiring because... You know, it, it's not easy to get, you know, it's not easy to get people into your vision. And, and and especially, I don't know how it is in Rwanda, but, you know, things like AI and these technology, they're sometimes a bit far-fetched for, especially for deep-rooted indigenous communities, for example, in Nigeria, you know, Nigeria has its own problems and 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 challenges and sometimes when you're talking of all oh, ai it feels like oh that's just something out there so i'm curious what what were some ways you know how were you able to get the rwandan community to understand the vision of what you you people were trying to do that's you and digital morganda to understand it and to say okay yes i want to dedicate some time to make this happen yeah i think one thing we we have come to understand is um there are over 2000 african languages and uh it, it's a um, it, there are, we are diverse um, but when it comes to Rwanda, uh, we, uh, we were lucky because uh, Kenya Rwanda, we, we are 13 million Rwandans. Uh, and uh, people like Rwanda, Kenya Rwanda is spoken uh, all across Rwanda. So if you come to Rwanda, um, you, whatever you, if you can speak Kenya Rwanda, you'll be very comfortable because everybody speaks it. And everybody values it, and everybody um, like, like it's, it's really valued. Uh, so whatever can promote Kenya Rwanda, people are really willing to 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 support it. Uh, so that's that's how we we were. I would say we can call ourselves lucky to have such an understanding. And the, another thing is. Sometimes we we focus on the technology. Uh, we focus on the technology, um, and you tell people about AI. But one thing we understood is if you focus on how this will be useful to them, uh, it's easy to get them on board. So we could say yes. Uh, with this tool, you can be able to speak to the computer, and it will understand you and People, especially who are who have some education, they will understand that. Oh, there is Siri that speaks English. I want Siri to speak in Rwanda at some point. So yeah, and that uh, made them to to con contribute. I see. That's that's very interesting. So you are you on the technical side of things. So I'm in, I'm interested to to learn more. What were so? What were some of the technic technical or technological use cases that came out of the digital Magana data set? Right. So I'm guessing there were some things that you couldn't do before that you could now do technologically with this data set that you had and what were some things that were explored with it? Yeah, so I guess there, there's still some open research 
even uh, the realities of Rwanda. Uh, but um, one 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 thing that came out was in Dembaza. So when we finished the data collection, we trained our first model. We noticed that many people were were calling uh, throughout COVID. Um, I think around 2020, yeah, throughout COVID when it started, there were a lot of, um, yeah, it was something unusual. It was something uh, big. So people wanted information. Uh, so they were calling the call center of uh, the Rwanda Biomedical Center. Uh, it's the um, institution in charge of health. So they, they wanted more information. Can I do this? Is this allowed? What about this? You know, many people were, um, were really interested. And we saw it as a way with, I think, uh, the mobile penetration in Rwanda is 78%. Um, so we saw it as a means. Can we use the technology to provide information? Um, so the idea was, can we create a chatbot that can provide um, COVID information? Um, and uh, that's how the Mbaza uh, project was created. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, it depends on how you see it. Uh, it's, it's, it's very technical to build a voice call chatbot. Uh, <laughs> so... Uh, uh, at least with the data, we had the momentum. We had the uh, we had the support. People understood that. Oh yeah, this is possible. We we didn't think we can create an infrastructure or a model for Kinyarwanda. So let's see if we can provide some support. And it was still in partnership with the uh, uh, GIZ. Um, so that's how the Mbaza was created. But to make it uh, to make the project feasible we divided into, into iterations. So the first iterations was to use the USST, so a rule-based chatbot. Um, uh, so that will cover a strong segment of the population, not everybody, uh, because with USSD you must be literate, uh, but it's something that's very prevalent, especially with mobile money. Uh, and then the next phase was to build a conversational chatbot. Uh, I think at that time it was Rasa. And then the next phase was to build a, a voice, but with IVR, uh, but with um, text-to-speech that can read the text. And then the last phase was to build the, the full conversational chatbot with speech-to-text. Um, and the pipeline. So yeah, we... Yeah, we were able to build the, the two, uh, and then the third and the fourth were not fully finished. We had some prototypes, and um, yeah, so from there we were like, okay, uh, it's it's way complex than we thought, um, and uh, there's still a lot of work. So what can we do? And I think in Digital Muganda, we, since we are Muganda, so we always believe in bringing, uh, bringing back or giving back to the community. So we, we open source the code and we created the community to help uh, build the, the solutions. Uh, so that was one application. Um, and since then, I think uh, uh, the community of, uh, we, we noticed, okay, if you can build a voice chatbot, uh, it requires, you, you need a very powerful uh, GPU servers. And I, I, I don't think in Rwanda our cloud supports it at the moment. Uh, I know they are, they are there, but the price and uh, the, the capabilities. So it, it's, it's a trade-off. Um, what if you create, let's say, um, simple um, within a certain targeted group? of people, people who have the internet, who have smartphones, but who can be used as, um, as a link to the general population. So yeah, I think currently we are working on something with community health workers uh, where they can use it to get information and they can disseminate within the population. Um, so yeah, and then the speech to text, once you start speech to text, 
you will find yourself in text to speech <laughs> yeah and uh there it's promising because now you can build things for um the disabled uh, uh you can build uh yeah there are I, I think uh once the association of the visually impaired they found out that we are working on it they actually reached out to us and they say can you do it for us um yeah so the applications are, are there um and uh we are still building them they are not fully from a research perspective there have been some great work uh, but from a production perspective um there is um yeah it's, it's still slow and steady progress. Yeah. yeah, it's always slow. You know, research can, can go quite fast because a lot of the environments are controlled, right? But production always goes slow and steady. I'm curious, what, so you said the, the, the third and fourth part didn't work out as, as expected. And the third part is the text to speech part due to challenges. What were some of, what were the major challenges affecting the text to speech? Was it just compute or because you had the data or was there something, was there a data requirement to, to it? Oh yeah. Uh, oh, <laughs> oh, these days, uh, I think it's my favorite technology these days because it's the one that keeps me awake at night. <laughs> so the thing is it actually made, okay. Let, let me go back. Uh, Kinyarwanda and many Bantu languages, uh, they are tonal languages. So we have tones. Um, and uh, we have tones. So the tones can be vowel tones. Uh, I think we have two tones. Um, and then we have what we call vowel lengthening. So a vowel is lengthened. But when we write it, we, we remove the tones. So there, there are no tones. So two words can be written the same, but uh, they are um, they, they are pronounced, pronounced differently. differently. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. One example: the way you write "family" and the way you write "the door" is similar. So they are all umurjango, but umurjango is the door, and umurjango is family. So yeah. But when we we worked on it, we found out that, that yeah, there there's still some challenges. How do we capture the tones? Because the tones really matter in Kinyarwanda. Uh, second is there are small libraries that are, are very important for text to speech. Uh, for example, num numbers to text, text to numbers, symbols, and then for African languages, uh, we have um words that are borrowed so for example un in in our languages will be un uh, so like names like in rwanda we tend to have uh i would say a, either christian or arabic uh uh first names so like in Kinyarwanda, we don't have x but if there's Xavier, uh, we'll still write with Xavier. So now when you are building the text to speech, you will need to take into account those. Uh, and uh, those are still uh, some uh, challenges. And then we, we went into it and we found that, oh, now we need to bring in the linguist. Uh, but given that our African language, especially from a linguistic part, I, I don't know in other countries, but in Rwanda, it was not something that was really valuable. Uh, we all like to speak <laughs> in Rwanda and everything, but oh, <laughs> really yeah. Lingu in... linguists were not like that. <laughs> yeah, so we, we had to find ways to bring in linguists, but you find that many of them, uh, they, 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 we have old research. Um, mm. uh, many of them, they left the field. Or they are no longer in Rwanda. So it's something we are still looking into and to see how we can uh, work through it. Um, and I guess one of the reasons we really 
believe in open source is partly because of that, because we found out that, um, yeah, from a research perspective, you can build something, but if you really want something that can be used, uh, many people must collaborate. Uh, and uh, yeah, for Kinyaranda, we believe if we put it out there, someone will add on, on, on it, and then we can have something strong that we can finally use later. I see. I see. It's, in, it's interesting that, first of all, the compute was not even the only challenge. And the cha this, this challenge that you describe, it, it seems, you know, it comes from sort of, so you have a data, and now how do you make this data useful for you? And this is where the challenge came in. Okay, how do we normalize some of these texts? How do we take into account this and that? That's that's quite interesting. I guess coming from a, if I come with my brute force machine learning hammer, it's just throwing the data there and let it just learn. But it, it shows <laughs> that it shows that you, you don't always get good performance. At least back in the day, when there were not things like large models, right? You had to think differently about training. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, especially. So the thing is with voice technology, uh, first of all, culturally, Africa, we are a voice-based uh, culture. Wow. So we only transmit, our ancestors transmitted information through voice, through stories. Yeah. And uh, yeah, technology evolved. We had to, to, to resort to writing, but people still prefer the, the voice. Yeah. So... A voice is a strong medium to convey information. That's why radios are famous, televisions are, are very mm -hmm. famous, uh, stories we, we grew up listening. Uh, they, are, they are way powerful. Um, so at least we, we understand that. Uh, and uh, now, how do you convey that information? So... It's, it's not just about the technology, it's, it's about the culture, it's about uh, the way people live. And it's also a, a, a rediscovery of our language because you'll find that we were not, um, for example, Kinyarwanda and many African languages, uh, they are written systems uh, were not designed by Africans. They were designed by missionaries who wanted to to preach so it wasn't oh this is how language should be pronounced uh, but it's more yeah how can we create an easy system to convey the message of christ to, to to the people and then even the research at least the early research were not done by by the, the natives so you find that by claiming the voice it's also claiming um, what's yours and understanding what's yours. And I, I think whoever works with voice gets to understand it. You you get to find out about the the origins of the language, the, its evolution. Um, at, at some point, yeah, you cannot you cannot just go into technology. And I, I think, for example, Kathleen has been working on Swahili with Common Voice, and he wrote an article to explain the how Swahili was was pushed and when you look at it, you're like, oh, this is different from what I, I knew. Um, and uh, yeah, by claiming that, um, by, by understanding or understanding that culture and trying to bridge it, uh, so the idea is how do you recognize, recognize and reconcile uh, the, the past and uh, bringing, bring it to the present. So it's, it's, it's an interesting journey. <laughs> Very interesting, and uh, I I'm yeah. still on it, and yeah, we will see where it will take us. That's that's lovely. That's so you are really like full on um, voice, uh, text to speech, or just basically voice technologies. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, if I may speak on that, um, the good thing is. <laughs> uh, when you do voice, you you have to do everything. So mm -hmm. when you do voice at some point, 
especially as a company, you know, we mm -hmm. we are building solutions. So we we do data collections, uh, but now since Mbaza, we we are looking how can we use this technology to provide information, especially to those marginalized, especially mm -hmm. to those uh, who do not have that access. And yeah. then another thing is also analytics as well. Uh, so you find out that the solution is not just, oh, I have speech to text, this is it. Mm. <laughs> you, you, you have to understand the person you're talking to, you have to understand the limitations. And uh, I think recently when I was reporting a, a, our UX, I told him, I, I said, you know, I, I, I cannot say what we will do because uh, the new interface with voice, I, I do not know it yet. So it will depend on the realities on the ground. So uh, are you doing it for, let's say, visually impaired? Are you doing it for uh, an illiterate? Are you doing it with uh, uh, a person, a digital illiterate? Are you doing it with a person who uses a phone? So depending on the realities on the ground, so you build the solutions based on them. And now they might want a chatbot. I think that's that's the easiest part um but they might also let's say at some point i want to analyze so they will want a, a name entity recognition to to pick some information they, they might want uh, to 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 understand the sentiment uh or they and i think this is the one i'm really interested in and i came to look into it the machine translation voice translation so you find um given that we are not a big tech company to put all the resources to, to just say, okay, this will just use voice to do it. So you find that, yeah, the speech recognition is just the first part and then you must use all the NLP tools to, to reach out to the solution. Yeah, so, yeah. I see. So it's, it's actually, it, it, it is called voice technology, but it's, beyond voice in the sense that you need the other aspects of NLP. You also need the linguistic side. I see. Okay. That's especially when you're doing it for production, because then you're really working from a use case or an impact perspective. You're doing something, you want to build something that gives, that has impact, not just for the sake of building it. Yeah. I see. Yeah. That is, that's quite, in, that's very, very interesting. So Mbaza NLP, that's a community, right? Could you tell us more about this community? Yes. Yeah. As, as I mentioned uh, before, um, yeah, when we finished, we realized, and, and I think all of this came with Mbaza. Before we, we were like, oh, it's easy. But once we started working on Mbaza, we were like, wow, there's still some work to be done. I see. Um, and um, yeah, so there's there's still some work, and then there is a need. There is a need. Uh, I think that's that's for sure because um, I, I talked the visually impaired. One of them came to us. He reached out to us. He said, "Oh, I know what you guys are doing. I want you to help us because this technology can help us." And then he took he took us to to their offices, where they are. And then he showed us how they read, um, how they read a text in Kinyarwanda. They just use the text to speech in English. And for us, we could not hear anything. For him, he, he's been used to it, that he, he can understand it. But for us, we were like, this is gibberish. Um, and then when you look at it, you find that the first three years of of school in Rwanda, in public school, is in Kinyarwanda. So, what happens to a child who 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 is visually impaired? So they can use Braille, but can they use um, can they read using the technology? Can the technology help them? You find that uh, we we reached out to a person who was working uh, with children uh, who has autism. So children who has who have autism, they 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 require um, a, a different approach to education. So you find that they 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 like more like voice, 
something like sensational. So how, how do you reach out to that kid and how do you educate them? So um, you, you, you find that uh, there, there, there is a need and there are, there are many needs that we do not know. Um, and it, it's not just the technology, it's not just the data, it's not just the model, it's the libraries around it, it's maybe new architectures. And um, so our idea was, okay, let's open source it. And um, more people will contribute, more people will know it, more people can use to build solutions. And for example, one thing that we did throughout the Mbaza was we, we with Mozilla, there was a hackathon that we organized and we found the ideas people have. And if you keep it yourself, yeah, as a, as a researcher, of course there is, uh, and as I pioneer, there's the big tech holders will, take, will, will, will mm. have it. <laughs> hey, but one thing the big big tech will not know is they don't have um, they don't know the realities on the ground and they will never mm -hmm. win because yeah it's not like it's economically viable so it's something they will find out <laughs> once it has taken off but the local communities know uh, so by making it open source you you democratize it you give it to more people to to be able to, to have a starting point because it's it's expensive to do voice. It's really expensive. You you have to collect hours and hours of voice technology. I think when we are training our models, we have 200 gigabytes of data. And how many people in Africa can afford to, to train such models? Um, and the idea is when you do it, uh, hopefully people will give it back. And you, we get to benefit. So when someone creates an open source model and performing, we get to benefit uh, and we get to build an infrastructure. So the idea is to build an infrastructure that at some point people now can come and take and then they can use it to, to build a custom uh, system. So that, that's that's how uh, the Mbaza community was created. Um, yeah, and then uh, I think it started in 2022, uh, but the thing is, the same issue I faced when I started my journey is the same issue <laughs> that came back. Uh, yeah, like most people who were interested were just students and enthusiasts. Mm. So without any background uh, with AI. And uh, yeah, so from there, I think our first year was mostly training people. So we, we organized some uh, machine learning uh, training uh, and luckily we we've been partnering with AI Saturday Kigali to to organize regular training. So we have moved uh, past the training. So for us, is focusing on building solutions. And uh, yeah, I think also um, our partnership with JZ helps because they've been also organizing similar. Uh, capacity building uh, mm -hmm. yeah um, and uh, yeah so since then I think we have now more engineers uh, be because to build a solutions is not just like machine learning engineers so you need product designers you need front-end developers you need back-end developers you need linguists you need people who will test um, so once you bring them together you, you find that um, you, you get to have a, a wholesome system. You know, they say it takes a village to raise a child and I'll say it takes a village to, to create a, an air product in Africa. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that's the background and that, that's how it, it came to be. The, the I see. And was it, so you said the people who, who came were students and enthusiasts. Was it, you know, how easy or hard was it to to get people interested in AI? Was it, is it something like they already knew about it and so they just, they were interested? Or did you have to go an extra step to make, convince them to be interested in AI for them to come for the training? I'm trying to understand what the, 
you know, what was the environment, you know, the, the, the environment in Kigali, maybe back then in terms of the reaction to AI, is it something that many people already were interested in and wanted to learn? Or was it something you had to explain to them what AI is and why, why they should be interested in it? So there are people who are interested. Um, so there, there's like a contrast. On one hand, you want people who can contribute. So, and that, that is professionals or someone with an experience mm -hmm. uh, because it's, it's, it's a advanced tool so that you, you want someone who can contribute. But you find those people are busy. Um, they already have other jobs and uh, they, are, they, are, they are busy basically. So um, now to convince them to say, oh, come and this is the start, but we can build with time, you know, it, it takes a lot of convincing. So th those are, those, it, it took time to, to, to convince. Uh, you find even, um, I think when I started and I could reach out to uh, the graduate program we have here at Carnegie Mellon, uh, you find nobody was really working on Kinawanda. So you find a person who, who did data science. Uh, at the end, they end up doing data science, like uh, uh, simple data science, data engineering. Yeah. Not delving yeah. deep into AI. And they will be busy doing that and they will not have time for the community. But on the other hand, they're like undergrad students. Uh, they have time on their hands. They are interested and they can say, oh, uh, this is interesting. And I've been hearing about AI, so I would want to come. So that's the, that's the challenge we had. Uh, how do we uh, improve the capacity of those who are willing and have time, but not have the knowledge and the know-how? And how do we convince those with the know-how to spare time because it's volunteer work? and uh, contribute. So yeah, that's the challenge. And I think this year is when we are finding the right balance. I see, I see. Speaking of this year, I think the the rounding up question, what are, you know, we just recently entered 2024, it's pretty exciting year. So many things are happening in AI. Um, and I think so many more things will happen. AI is really progressing at a very, very fast pace. What are some of the things that you're excited for this year and maybe in the coming years? Excited for personally, excited for digital maganda, excited for your voice technology journey that you are on? excited oh maybe not excited <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe uh what's yeah. the opposite of excited maybe sad so i don't uh, excited is, is probably more positive but generally what's your you know your mindset for this year yeah no no, no I, I get that i get that I, I think this is the year we finally uh put forward ai products so Ooh. it's I'm, I'm excited about it, but I'm also I'm like wow, it's, it's a lot of pressure. <laughs> That's yeah. why I, was, <laughs> I really thought of excited. So I think with the technology that we've been building for now five years, uh, it's we understand what works, and it's not it's not like fully the end goal, but at least now you you understand the capabilities. And you have talked with enough stakeholders to understand that this is what they need and this is what we can offer. So this year, at least for Digital Uganda, that's something we are really working on. And then we've been working on um, uh, other African languages. Uh, so yeah, this year we, we are looking forward to produce more data for other African languages, uh, which is, it's exciting. It's exciting. I think it's a, uh, yeah, like Africa, we are different. We have different uh, language families. We have different cultures. So uh, the work you will do in Kinyarwanda is different from the work you will do in other African languages. So yeah, that's also something we are excited about. Uh, and then um, we, 
we've been working to bring together people. Uh, that's something uh, we've been working to bring together people to make them understand the need of um, AI and the work we are doing. Uh, and on that, ChatGPT really helped us. So it, it made everybody to understand that, oh, this is, this is really important. And uh, we are looking forward to organizing. There will be many conferences, so bringing more people together. And um, I would say uh, the ecosystem um, is still not as united as we want it to be. Uh, by that, I mean, uh, you find that there are people, for example, with data. Uh, they, they have the data. For example, I would say, like parliaments, you know, they record their sessions. So they have the data, but uh, can they share the data? And, you know, it's something easy that, that can be done. You find that there are people with the technical know-how, uh, companies or even private individuals. Do they know where they can get the data, where they can get the resources? So it's still, um, yeah, there's still that gap. And then you find, for example, there are people who need the solution. Um, I was talking to someone who they, they, they were doing some field recordings. Uh, they go around doing interviews. So they do them in Kinyarwanda. Now they give them to transcribers, human transcribers, and it takes one week to transcribe one hour. So you find that it's not very efficient and there are so many companies who, who do that automatically. Uh, and, you know, it takes a lot of resources and time, but they, 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 they have to, to do it, but they don't know that, oh, people have done an automatic way. It's not perfect, but if it, it can save you what you could have done in a week, you can do in one one day, you know, that's, that's a plus for you. So we need all those stakeholders to, to come together and to be able to share and to say, oh, I have this, so I can do this, or can you do this for me? So that, that can really boost the ecosystem and make it grow at a rapid pace. I see. Wow, that's, I like the last point, you know, really, bringing people together that's it sounds simple but it's really not easy it takes a lot of patience <laughs> not at all. yeah it, dealing i think i i feel dealing with humans is way more difficult than dealing with machines and ai <laughs> <laughs> because with machines you can sort of predict and and predict their behavior and analyze with with humans it's it's very, very complicated. And I think that's what makes the challenge quite interesting. I'm very excited to to see the the new products that you and your team and your company will be unveiling into the world. That's that's gonna be very, very exciting to see and really excited about new applications that your team brings in the coming years that's that's wonderful um looking forward to the year when you'll be like yeah somewhere yeah he's the one did did that voice technology stuff of can you wonder yeah that's the guy spent his whole passion his whole life you know really dedicated to voice technology and now look look what has happened it's 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 a dream that will come to reality sooner rather than later it's it's yeah. rare to find passionate people um you know especially with the way things are moving the pace at which things are going it's it's rare to find people who still like keep on you know hold on to their passion and are still passionate i have met quite some i've met a number of people you know back like three years ago they were very excited about 
let's say language modeling AI or something. And now it's a bit depressing because, okay, these big guys are coming and taking over everything. I don't see my future anywhere for the audience. Cause I'm pretty sure there are people who are feeling like this with the way AI is going. How do you Samuel, how do you maintain your, your vision and yeah, so maintain your vision and maintain your maintain. I mean, I don't know. Do you feel sad sometimes about the AI thing? I, I don't know how you feel, but how do you maintain your vision and maintain your you, I don't know, your goal or something? Not lose hope, basically. Yeah, I, I think first of all, it's uh, it's like a a mountain. You you have ups and downs, so. Maybe one example is um, when ChatGPT was released, it was really terrible at Kinyarwanda and many of other African languages. So at that time we were working on um, on a machine translation. And we were like, wait a minute, can we use machine translation to translate and improve the accuracy? So we spend a lot of time and energy working on machine translation. And I think we did some tests back in November. Uh, it scored, we we used linguists, so we we evaluated use, using humans and it scored seven out of 100. Uh, then comes January, end of January with a new release. Uh, someone calls me and say, hey, it has gotten good. So we go back and we, we test again and it has gotten 85%. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> oh my God. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So we've been working to improve the machine translation, uh, I think for six months now. And uh -huh. turns out they just figure out the way. <laughs> <laughs> they just put more data yeah, and I... more compute on that thing. <laughs> yeah. You don't know what they did, you know, they will never tell you and all. So, yeah, yeah that, that can be... And some might also be your own data, too, that you open source. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's it's open source, so... Yeah, that, that can feel uh, discouraging. Um, but the thing is, you know, there is... Like I said, there is... There is a reality of Africa that few people understand. So, and especially us who are in, let's say, who, who, who got to meet develop, the developing countries, developed countries, um, there is another reality that still is still in Africa. So you find some regions, illiteracy is like 40%. Um, and for me, many people can look them up as challenges, but those are opportunities. So uh, there is a lot of our culture that we have not captured. There is a lot of people, you know, we have uh, the youngest population. So those people must be educated. So imagine if back in our days we were educated using ChatGPT, it would have really boosted our capacity. So, and those realities, you know, they are not monetary, monetarily, um, valuable attractive, at the yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, the first person to use mobile money in my family was my grandfather. Yeah, because mobile money, when it came, or even M-Pesa, it was meant for people in the village. They don't have mm -hmm. access to banks, and they can use it to to receive money from people abroad or in the country. Mm. So, if you could have said to Mastercard or Visa, "Oh, I'm working <laughs> on mobile money," they could have laughed. Uh, but turns out these days, I think one of them invested in M-Pesa because that's the future of of um, uh, fintech. So that's how I see it, and that's really what keeps me passionate. So it's not like Oh, I'll compete with Google. I'll build a Google Translate. No, I will, I will always lose. I'll build a chatbot. I will lose. Like, it's just they wake up and they say, oh, can we do it in this language? They have all the resources to immediately do it. 
but I, I should focus on a challenge that even if they find out, they will not care. And I think for, for me, one of, I can look at four, four industries uh, that, that are open to disruption. So I would say there is education, um, education. So it's not just school. It's, you know, how, how are children brought up? You know, like maybe we don't quantify, for example, the importance of the radio uh, within uh, Africa, but radio is really a big, big thing because it provided information to people. So whatever brings information, whatever provides information, especially to those who will not otherwise get information or knowledge. I can look at um, uh, health. So health is also a big, big thing. Uh, I can look at um, uh, justice or government or administration. Uh, so that's also something very big uh, that people have not have not really tapped into. Um, yeah, with with the way the world works, let, let me expand on this. With the way the world works, everything is becoming digital. So even the governments, they are digitalizing. Uh, but the government, they have the structure, they have the way they work. But you find not everybody has access to it. Not everybody understands it. So how do you democratize that? How do you make it available to people? How do you provide legal assistance? How do you empower the lawyers? How do you empower the judges? So th that's still a very open uh, um, topic and there is this project called citizen engagement how do you make the citizen be engaged within the work of the government so that that's a an opportunity there that uh and it's very big and then the last thing is agriculture so you find that for me those are the four that i'm looking for of course there is the big ones like finance and, and but for me those those you you not find many people, and the the big uh, companies will not meet you there. <laughs> so yeah, uh, find what's really local, what's based on the the, the realities on the ground. Uh, you'll find, for example, many African languages are disappearing. So that's an opportunity. How do you capture the the, the the tradition, the culture, the language, how do you preserve that? So that, that's still an opportunity there. You'll find, um, yeah, like uh, the marginalized communities. So there are people, yeah, people don't care about uh, people in the villages, people can't read. So how do you capture that? And then another thing that really, um, I'm, I'm glad I found out, is um, the community. So I'm really glad with the community. Uh, I think I got to meet you through Masakane and I, I remember seeing when you, you were posting the models, I'm like, wow, do these people even sleep? <laughs> and, and then you could go on the questions and you you ask a question and you see people are answering. So the community part is, is very important. Um, I think from a... Uh, from, uh, African level, and even the African diaspora, like it's solid, but I wonder how it is from a local level. So I think we need to strengthen the local level as well, mm -hmm. um, because yeah, the local level, it's where the solutions, the solutions will come to the local level. So how do we strengthen the local community? and? For example, when we think of AI, especially from a product perspective, uh, from a research might be different, but from a product perspective, it will be a solution for the people. So it's not just AI researchers or software developers. It will be everybody should be involved. So how do you find a way to bring everybody, especially institutions, uh, like existing institutions? So they have the know-how, they have the the knowledge, they have the experience, they've been working on the ground. So how do we 
bring them on the table? How do we establish talks? And at first, especially when people are starting, it's, it's tricky and people don't understand. But the first thing is make them interested. You, you have to give them something sometimes. You have to, to give them services. Um, I think there is these institutions we went to at some point and we were tol- telling them about AI. And for them, they were like, oh, we have books that were written and we want to put them on, online. So, you know, for them, they are looking at digitalization while you're looking at AI. <laughs> so yeah. sometimes, yeah, you just create a website for them. <laughs> and uh, hope hope that in turn they will say, okay, now, yeah, you can use all those books we have in the library. I see. I see. That sounds very, very inspiring. That was a real lot of information that you gave. So if it's really about looking into those areas that the the bigger companies will not find interesting but are interesting because they're impactful to to the communities and you using your 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 grounded ex, experience to understand better how to deal with these communities one thing i'm uh, one last question so what you said is very motivating and hopeful. I'm curious how that is balanced with um, with staying afloat financially. Because if if one goes for you know focusing on the communities and these these areas are not always you know financially attractive, and they don't always bring you money as a company. So, you know, how does one balance your, you know, what you said with being financially afloat? So is it then leveraging grants and, and funding and support? Is is that it? Or what do you think? Huh, that, that's a, a good question, actually. Um, yeah, what, what I can say is, you might be surprised with what you'll find out. So, you know, for example, if a person thinks agriculture has no money, they have not seen, they have not been in agriculture because there are people with money in agriculture, like cooperatives who makes a lot of money. Mm. Um, so it's not, when we look at marginalized communities, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that there won't be money. And by marginalized, part of it is they don't have access to the information that you have and the know-how. So you find a, an old man or uh, someone from the village, they, they have their money or they have the finance, but they don't know how they can use the tool. So that, that's first uh, the, the, the thing. But... I'll say, especially in the early stage, yes, grants are really needed. And I would, and I'm still looking to see how we can be able to create an awareness, especially for us who, who at least have some visibility to bring more investment. It's not even a grant, it's an investment to bring more investment because it's a, it's a, it's still a nas- nascent um industry uh so we need investment we need and it can be through a through a form of a a grant um but we need investment and then another thing is uh, i'm still looking on how we can do it uh when you look at established businesses within africa they should be the ones who can be ahead uh, so I'm talking of telcos, I'm talking of banks, because they, they, they only cover a certain portion of the population. So through the work we do, we can uh, bring up more people and then they, they, they tend to gain. But unfortunately, you find even the big techs are the ones who are interested more in investment than even the local people. <laughs> so. Sometimes it's sad, but I guess part of bringing people together involves also bringing 
the local people with the, the funds to contribute. So the, the how it's very tricky and every country, every place is different. And I may speak from Rwanda because let's say people love Kenya Rwanda, but when you go to another country, actually people might not understand it. So the how is, is tricky. So um, I, I, I think for everybody listening, it will be a different journey. And I cannot say, oh, this is the way. But at least from a continental perspective, if we are able to bring together as many people as possible, a lot will be done. And, and But another thing is even those industries that we consider to be like there's no money, we might be surprised because one thing I got to understand is information in Africa is still very expensive. So the first thing you need to get the information, you need to say, okay, the health system, how does it work? Who has the money? Like understand the, the entire process and then have insiders. So once you get the insiders, they can really show how things work. So, and then we can navigate based on how, how they work. It's not like we will make it our way. We'll have to adapt it to their way and hopefully make it to see uh, the way, uh, to see our our intended goal and to adhere to it and support it. That's very lovely. That's a wonderful piece of advice. Thank you so much, Samuel. Thank you very, very much. It's been a real honor to talk with you again, Samuel. This has been one of those um, really much appreciated discussions that we've had talking around AI in Africa and creating lasting impact with technology on the African continent. Thank you so much, Samuel, for this discussion. Yeah, thank you very much, Chris. It's been wonderful having you with us and thank you for gracing us with your presence.